Hello and welcome to um, session 4398 on day 475 of uh, whichever month it now is. Um, I believe it's somewhere around April to May, maybe, maybe it's still March, maybe it's June. Um, I know it's 2020, I remember that bit. But other than that, the days are now blurring into one, into each other, and um, we're still here. We're still here. And um, I believe in the UK today, we have at least confirmed that we have passed the peak of the pandemic um, as far as this uh, first wave goes. And um, um, I'm sure that, um, you know, every different country is approaching it in different ways and um, I hope everyone here in the um, international um, order of um, olfactory um, omnivorous order of hermits, the ooh, 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 um, are okay. I hope you're all okay and well. Now today what we're going to do is we're going to quickly cover Givora and he said according to Dion Fortune. If you're totally new here, then most of this won't be making much sense to you. Um, so I would advise going back um, through maybe the last 15 videos. Um, I've also managed to work out a hack into Facebook, um, not into their offices, just for the purposes of the recording, but um, um, in terms of being able to uh, separate out these videos out of the units and into MP4 files, so we can um, at least separate all of these out of Facebook in case uh, um, Facebook decide to switch them all off at some point. Um, so uh, we'll all be recorded for posterity. Um, although, to be honest, only me, because the comments won't be um, actually um, hacked in that. So you can say what you want. Um, I'll, I'll be able to just imagine that um, uh, no one was saying anything while I was talking to camera. So um, but in the meantime, just in case it does stay on Facebook, I would encourage you to ask questions and say things in the recording. So um, we're going to cover Gibora and Hay said, and I'm going to read from Dion Fortune first so that I don't forget or I don't um, run out of time to do it because it's very important what Dion Fortune has to say about these two Sephiroth. And I briefly wanted to talk about Adeptus Major and Adeptus Exemptus again before we cross the abyss in our final three sessions of this set of 10 um, sessions between session 41 and 50. Yesterday we made a great story up together and that was a very practical exercise. If you're after practical tarot, creative tarot, again go back through um, um, any one of the 40 odd recordings. Um, we've done a lot of practical stuff, a lot of beginner stuff, some creative stuff, but now we're way into the abstract areas um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the Tarot of the Secret Dawn and its uh, creation, its discovery um, in the archives of the Golden Dawn. And I believe Derek's in the group at the moment. Um, so introduce yourself again, Derek, if I've missed that, um, because Derek discovered some manuscripts in the archive of the Golden Dawn when it was passed to the Library of Freemasonry and as a result of a collaborative work with Janine Hall, a Canadian artist who's um, designing a deck um, of major arcana for us. In the meantime, she took a break from that project and designed the Tarot of the Secret Dawn. And I just wanted to talk about that as an example of Um, that's the god name of Keitha. Um, so um, I wanted to uh, use this as an example of initiatory tarot, which is what we're talking about in the, these sessions. And, and then finally, I'm going to read um, for our bedtime story. We're going to get back to some bedtime stories with uh, gems in the lockdown um, series. And I'm going to read one of my favorite pieces by Terence McKenna, an ethnobiologist um, who um, was pretty into um, um, 
um, hallucinant Jennings and whilst I may not entirely agree with all of his stuff on hallucinogenics or his worldview, um, he did write something very fascinating that I'd like to read to finish with for our contemplation as we approach the top of the tree when the whole universe becomes one thing. And the 10 of Malkuth, um, the one and the zero become a one of Keitha, which eventually becomes a zero. So the whole model folds in on itself. We get halfway through our 50 um, lessons, and then we can come back out the other side at the same time as we um, start to get back to some sort of new normal life on the other side of this journey. It is a little bit like a plane journey in that we're all in it together. We have to keep ourselves occupied and safe. And we have to trust the pilots. And uh, when we get out the other side, it will be a different landscape, that's for sure. So Geborah and the Hay said, as we've seen from the tree of life, everything is in balance. And Geborah is a structural um, marshalling, literally Mars and marshalling of forces and he said is the loving kindness that expands into the universe. Um, we have the hermit card, um, which is the card of our a magical order that we've formed in our little group here, um, between Tifereth, beauty and love. So um, we are the lovers of beauty or the beauty of love, and that's the hermit. And so he holds the light between these two things. You'll also notice that the wheel card is on this path. And this is because down this pillar, he said, is the first time that time appears on the tree of life. Above this line here, the abyss, there is no time. And that's why these three tend to merge together. Um, time is only formed here in he said. So all of our models and our understanding of time start to go a little bit awry when we reach he said as we go through the initiatory system. And the Adeptus Exemptus has to really let go of their sense of linear time, um, a consistent um, identity and everything else in order to make this strange path across the abyss into the dark night of Bina. Gibora, meanwhile, is the Adeptus Major, the sort of almost like the Army Major, um, marshalling all of your forces together, um, getting a practical sense of what magic is all about. And in effect, you invent your own magical system here. Having gone through the Adept grades, you're now at a grade where you can actually invent your um, own magical system um, from everything that you've learned below the veil and slightly above it with the help and assistance of your holy guardian angel that um, is connected in Tifereth because that is the direct connection straight up to Keitha. So the Adeptus Major um, marshals together their own uh, magical system. Then here you marshal together your own philosophical system, your own internal um, a sense of what the universe is all about in a consistent, congruent, and comprehensive manner. And then you jettison the whole lot and you lay that whole ladder down because now you can actually use it to make that final step um, above the abyss. And that's really how the system sort of um, projects in this tree travel up the tree of life. But the model can also be used not only in terms of looking at someone's spiritual life and their psychological life and any of the issues in their life. When you do a tree of life reading for them, you can see where they're out of balance, um, for example, but also from a social point of view. And that's what I wanted to look at with Dion Fortune. In the Mystical Kabbalah, which is a book that uh, I swear every time I put it down, uh, Dion Fortune is reincarnated or resurrected. She sneaks into the room and she writes new pages in it. Because every time I go back to this book, and out of all of the books I've ever read, which must be thousands, um, this book is the one that constantly surprises me when I go back to it and I find new revelations in it, new stuff that I thought, oh, I see, 
Oh, that's interesting. Oh, you crafty little minx, you. Um, it's Dion Vodgin always constantly surprises me when I go back to the um, the book. And so sometimes I deliberately leave it for a while and then come back and read it. And it's like reading a totally new book. Um, she was way ahead of her time. Um, I've just finished actually uh, for a Magica school um, reloading the four uh, video classes I did called the Fires of Azrael on Dion Fortune. And um, I'd forgotten just how ahead of her time she actually was in terms of her understanding of, of psychoanalytical ideas, um, sociology, um, psychic defense. Um, she wrote a book on um, all sorts of things. She was way ahead of her time, um, a joy to read. So let's just read a little bit about what she says about Hayset. And she makes a very important point about Hayset and Gibora having to be treated as similar things. They have to be treated as a pair. So um, um, let's have a look. So, and she uses these phrases, anabolic, upbuilding, and catabolic, meaning breaking down. So she sees um, Hayset as building up and Gebora as breaking down. So I'll read this first bit, and then um, I'll read a second bit from a bit later that shows how it applies to society. So um, where does she say? Um, so he said, being the first sephira of the microprosopus or the manifest universe, that's the universe below the um, um, veil, um, represents, uh, sorry, below the abyss, represents the formulation of the archetypal idea, the concretation or concretion of the abstract. So basically she's saying that he said is the first where things get real. Um, up above, um, Keitha, Hokma, Bina, things are very abstract as we're gonna find out, but then he said is when it first gets real. When the abstract principle that forms the root of some new activity is formulating in our minds, we are operating in the sphere of Hayset. Let an example serve to make this clear. And she is brilliant at giving examples of what all of this abstract stuff means. Supposing an explorer is looking out from a mountain over a newly discovered country and sees that the inland plains lying behind the coastal ranges are fertile and that a river flows through these plains and makes its way up to the sea through a gap in the mountain chain. He thinks of the agricultural wealth of the plains, transport down the river, a harbour in the estuary, for he knows that the scour of the river will have made a channel by which ships can come in. In his mind's eye, he sees the wharfs and the warehouses, the stores and the dwellings. He wonders whether the mountains contain minerals and pictures a railway line alongside the river and branch lines up the valleys. He sees the colonists coming in and the need for a church, a hospital, a goal, and the ubiquitous saloon. His imagination maps out the main street of the township, and he determines to stake corner lots that he may prosper with the prosperity of the new settlement. All this he sees while virgin forest covers the coastal belt and blocks the mountain passes. But because he knows that the plains are fertile and that the river has come through the mountains, he sees in terms of first principles or the development that follows. While his mind is working this, he is functioning in the sphere of Hayset, whether he knows it or not. And all those who can also function in terms of Hayset and think ahead as he does, seeing the thing that must arise from given causes, long before the first line is drawn on the plan or the first brick laid in the trench, are able to possess themselves with the valuable land where the wharfs must be built and the main street must run. Okay. And I'm reminded by that. Um, I read a couple of the biographies of, um, uh, or autobiographies of, um, uh, well, Disney. 
and yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's let's not get into the um, colonization. Um, Dion Fortune was a product of her time as well, in lots of other ways that she was way ahead of her time. Um, as was Crowley and a lot of the other people from a hundred years ago that um, we still revere as esoteric teachers, um, like Blavatsky and so forth. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Walt Disney, and um, there was a story that was really interesting, uh, one of the many stories about Disney, where as they were flying over the swampland, which again, he um, uh, bought up before anyone quite realized what was happening, um, that um, someone asked him what he was looking at. He was focusing on a particular piece of this swampland and he said, oh, that's where the bench will go. And um, basically, he could see the bench that would be necessary for people to sit in, in the center of the whole um, area for the park that he was visualizing. But he could see the bench. He could see the bench. And it's that sort of hayseed type thinking that is ahead of everyone else. Um, and so that's why it's up at the top before the wheel and the hermit and the strength and the hierophant comes down into it, passing everything that has been built in the past, all of the energy of the past and the traditions into Hayseed. But it's from Hayseed that we direct the flow of that and then the form of it down through popular awareness and then into final manifestation. So um, um, it's the people who are operating up here. Now, they may not be spiritual people. They may not be um, a Kabbalists or anything else, but as Dion Fortune says, they are operating, whether they know it or not, in those moments straight from Hayseed. They are sort of channeling right from the top down the branches all the way to the bottom. And um, when they're open to that, then um, as long as it gets formulated in some way and balanced, it can be passed down into manifestation. Now, she then went on to talk about the main problem with Christian religion and other dualistic religions, which unlike Kabbalah and esotericism, really don't have a, um, uh, our systems really don't have good and evil. Um, it's a dualism that um, certainly we try and avoid because um, it's, it's difficult to actually transcend things when you're in a dualistic framework um, because you either have to be one thing or another. You can't transcend in order to um, um, get out of that sort of double bind. And so the problem often is that we make Hayset passive and Geborah active. So we think that we have to take what is rightfully ours and um, defend um, our emotions and our heart and be very passive um, on this pillar. But in fact, it should be the other way around, the other way around. Um, as Tan is saying, um, back to the Hayset thing, yeah, um, an athlete quite often visualizes the finish and then works backwards in their head. And a lot of NLP techniques do that as well, um, where we visualize where we are at the end and then play it backwards constantly so we feel that as if we are just stepping a step into what that inevitable future actually is. So you have to make adjustments along the way, but um, that's part of the um, joy of it. So um, here is what um, uh, Dion Fortune goes on to say about Gibora. Um, let's have a thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, Gibora holds the central position on the pillar of sev severity. It therefore represents the catabolic or downbreaking aspect of force. 
catabolism, be it remembered, is that aspect of metabolism or the lie process which is concerned the release of force in activity. It has been said that good is that which is constructive, which builds up, and evil is that which is destructive, which breaks down. How false this philosophy is, we see when we try to classify, according to this principle, a cancer and a disinfectant. In the deeper, more philosophical teachings of the mysteries, we recognize that good and evil are not things in themselves, but conditions. Evil is simply misplaced force, misplaced in time, if it is out of date or so far ahead of its day as to be impractical. Misplaced in space, if it turns up in the wrong place, like the burning coal on the hearth rug or the bathwater through which um, goes um, which goes through the drawing room ceiling. Misplaced in proportion, if an excess of love makes us silly and sentimental, or a lo lack of love makes us cruel and destructive. It is in such things as these that evil lies, not in the personal devil which acts as adversary. So I quite like that because she gives a very practical, pragmatic view of how he said and Deborah actually work that mirrors a lot of the traditional Kabbalah as well. And she goes on to explain a little bit about how that affects society, which um, I'll leave you to discover. But I buried in the middle of this book is some really fascinating things that still apply to our everyday society by a woman very much ahead of her time. So I would encourage you to um, uh, get this book. It is limited in some regards to traditional Kabbalah, but it is um, a very useful book to see how Western esotericism really ran with Kabbalistic ideas and how they utilized them to map uh, the universe. So um, now we're going to come on to our Tarot of the Secret Dawn. Now, you don't have to buy this deck. Obviously, I would encourage you to do so. If you do, then you can buy it from the Game Crafter. It's a majors only deck. And it is unlike most tarot decks that you'll see because it's actually extremely sparse and symbolic. But in the symbolism, there is an awful lot of depth. This card, for example, is the High Priestess. And um, if you think about the High Priestess, then you might be able to see how that card would overlap on, on the High Priestess, both the Wade Smith one and the Thoth Tarot one. Um, I'll put up some examples where we've overlaid these cards onto the um, weight deck and the um, uh, Thoth deck. And the results were quite remarkable. This is the devil, for example. So you can see the reverse pentagram at the top. And the genesis of this deck, um, I'm going to explore this card here, which is the world. You'll notice the gate that's here and the moon above. Um, bonus points if you um, might guess why the moon is above the gate um, on the world card. Oh, and this one is one of my favorite ones. Whoops. He says dropping it. Is the hermit, of course. That one is a fairly obvious um, card. Um, that one is the hermit. Oh, of course, this is the card. Order. Um, this is the card um, of our uh, magical order, the Hermit. It's all about the lamp. It's all about the lamp. Um, what else? Um, this card here is one of my favorite designs as well. Um, the broken ladder with the two angel wings carrying it up. So it's full of very unique symbols. Um, um, uh, the egg and the rose cross. Um, this comes with its own meanings, but they do match book T, and I'll tell you for why in a moment. Um, 
one of my favorite cards um, as well. I mean, um, a lot of these cards are my favorite cards, I guess. But I particularly like the Blasted Tower, um, which you can see a scene at the bottom of the three crosses on Calvary with the lightning flashing down onto that central um, uh, cross, which is rather um, powerful, powerful image. Yes, it's our sigil of the lantern, definitely. So um, I just wanted to explain a little bit about um, um, how this uh, deck came about. Um, Derek discovered some, some scripts in the um, uh, archives of Golden Dawn. Um, said to him something along the lines of, is that a tarot deck that they're talking about there? Derek went back, he looked at all the manuscripts and said, uh, yeah, I think it is a tarot deck that they're talking about. And so between the lot of us, we then developed a tarot deck from a series of typewritten notes, which we have a picture of in here um, somewhere. Um, so this is in the original Golden Dawn deck. So you can see these sort of typewritten notes um how clear that would be for the screen there but that was from the original typewritten notes from the golden dawn and um it turned out that this was um by um a member of the golden dawn who went by the name of freighter x Oriente looks light from the east. So I just want to read out the section um, from this little booklet that we produced for the deck explaining um, each of the cards. Um, so you've gone through and explained them on the Tree of Life. Um, so I just wanted to read something about the background of EOL, Freighter EOL. The Adam who created this deck was known in the order of Stella Matatina as Freighter Ex Oriente Lux, Light from the East. This adept of the Amun Temple, the Golden Dawn offshoot, was in fact an English gentleman. An English gentleman, born in Ambleside, Cumbria, just slightly south of um, uh, where Tali lives, where I live, um, up in the Lake District. Born in Ambleside, Cumbria, named Neville Gauntlet Tudor Meakin. How English a name is Neville Gauntlet Tudor Meakin. Um, circa 1876 to 1912. He was described by none other than A. E. Waite as a very advanced occultist, and in character as a man of honor and very seriously concerned with his esoteric work. Wait wrote that Meekin had showed him a set of his own tarot images based on the Golden Dawn teachings in 1911. Now that's fascinating because Meekin was showing Wait his own tarot based on Golden Dawn in 1911, just after Wait had published um, the uh, Wait Smith tarot. Meekin was educated in Edinburgh and came from a family line of churchmen including vicars, curates, and deacons. He wrote at least three books, one called The Court of Sacharissa, A Midsummer Idol, 1904, and another, The Enemy's Camp, described at the time as a comedy of sunshine with Hugh Sheringham, to whom he left his estate. He was also author of The Assassins, A Romance of Crusades, written in 1902 which he um, dedicated to his mother and contains much about the Order of the East. It is unfortunate that Meekin died suddenly in 1912, aged around just 45, from the effects of TB. He had just returned from a trip to establish relationships between the English occult groups represented by Waite and Felkin and German groups, including a visit to Rudolf Steiner. Um, and his work appears extremely accomplished. He'd also traveled to Egypt in 1911 on Baha'i business. The Baha'i was another sort of secret society, occult order within all of the other orders, and was met with good favor by followers of that religion. He had been conferred as an Adeptus Minor by Waite in uh, Felkin's Temple at Bassett Road in London prior to his ambassadorial duties. At some point, he had held office as a master of the Ordo um, 
uh, tabulae rotunda, the order of the table round, a North Arthurian-based Rosicrucian group. He, in fact, claimed he was in a long line of succession of that group. Whilst we do not have an exact date for Meekin's creation of this deck, we assumed it was in the last few years of his membership of the Amun Lodge. And the manuscript is bound with a description of a vision in Egypt, which recalls Crowley's work in Egypt some years prior in 1904. To so have date of the deck between 1909 and 1911, likely closer to the later year just before his death in 1912. This would also date the date to just following the publication of the Waite Smith deck. So Meakin left this world having transcribed a series of visions of history potential which drew from the original well of the Golden Dawn teaching and experience. He evoked his knowledge of numerology, color symbolism, correspondence, Kabbalah, alchemy, astrology, and tarot into these visions. And whilst we're left with only the descriptions and no sign of the cards themselves, we were sure that they could again be rectified. And so that's what we did. Um, um, Tolly did some research on Meekin. Um, Derek provided the Golden Dawn research. I provided the design notes to turn Meekin's text into what I would imagine were the cards. And um, then Janine Hall also had a strange um, experience, which she relates in the little booklet of um, a figure standing next to her while she was designing the cards. And we hadn't described Meekin to her at any point during that time. And um, you might well know it that her description of the character would seem to meet Meekin, although we have no photographs of him, and it certainly would um, seem to match um, a likely description of Mr. Meekin. So um, the moon here, the moon is above the gate because, um, let me see what um, Michael's just put here. Um, and I was after, yeah, yeah, it, it, it symbolically correct, but I was after a very simple um, answer that it's Yisod. Um, the moon um, corresponds to Yisod and the gate corresponds to Malkuth. And what you can do with this deck because of the way Janine saw it as three levels on each card, you have sort of three levels, is that you can overlap them. And so what you can do is actually overlap them in their positions on the tree of life, and you get some absolutely astonishing um, overlaps. So here's the high priestess up at the top. Um, let's see if I can um, put that there. So there's the high priestess, but then down here, you can suddenly see that the um, egg, for example, um, gets heated up in the pyramid of fire. The egg is on one card, the pyramid of fire is on another. And similarly, um, the hill here gives rise the flaming um, brand, which then heats up the pyramid, which heats up the egg, which gives birth to the star, which lights the pylon, which makes the infinity symbol up at the top. Um, so you can actually overlay the cards onto the tree of life. And again, that was entirely coincidental. When we uh, designed the deck, we had um, no idea that we'd be able to do that sort of thing. Um, here, for example, you can see the crosses of Calvary before the initiation into Tifereth. And then you can see as well um, that, that even though Janine didn't mean to, the size of the lunar crescent here fits ideally a tree of life roughly drawn to scale to fit these cards. And again, she had no idea um, you'll see as well that star is perfectly positioned on Darth here on, on this line. And so, um, yeah, um, it was quite a magical thing to actually develop this, this deck. And, um, but what the purpose is, 
is for initiation. This is not a deck to read necessarily um, um, for tarot readings. He accessed it by scrying, by going on the planes of Tree of Life and scrying these images. It's called the Tarot of the Secret Dawn. It's um, a published print on demand from the Game Crafter, the GameCrafter.com. I think they are still operating at the moment. Um, I'm Facebook friends with JT Smith, who uh, runs a game crafter, and um, he, um, I, th I think they're sort of on on whatever the lowest form of operating to keep going can be at the moment. So. Um, it might not be possible to get it just at the moment, but certainly as we come back out of the peak and it's safe to do so, um, it's published by thegamecrafter.com. Um, so I just wanted to read then a little bit about the depth of symbolism that you can cram into a simple set of images. And hopefully, for those who've been watching all of the videos so far, this will make absolute sense in terms of the bottom of the tree of life when we talk about the world and the path between um, uh, Malkuth and Yisod, and this is called the world. In the first initiation upon the path as a neophyte, the candidate is introduced to the world of symbols, requiring complex learning and understanding of correspondence. They are told, the light shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehendeth it not. The portal remains open before him or her, yet there is no immediate entrance. The forces of the elements, the planets and the zodiac are all introduced at a conceptual level. They remain enigmatic and abstract, yet maintain their own inherent coherence. Unknown to the candidate, these images, these abstractions, these symbols of power are all formulating in their unconscious, indicated here by the hidden moon above the portal. The Hebrew letter Tau, the cross arc, is the signature of the divine in the world and an exemplar of the highest spirit. All things teach and our life is the process of that inquiry. In this image, we also see the Shekinah, the presence of God, often conceptualized as feminine, as the mandala, the oval here in the middle. This latter symbol is often depicted as the frame in which Christ or Mary take their place in transfiguration. Here, it is the transfiguration of the candidate as they take their first step on the path of initiation. Within the mandala is the Trinity cross, showing that creation is composed of duality, and that in the words of Mary the Jewess, Mary Prophetessa, one becomes two, two becomes three, and out of the third comes the one as the fourth, which we've just seen when we've been in this case said. It is also the sin of the three officers of the temple creating a triangle around the candidate during one of the most crucial points of the neophyte ceremony, when the light within is acknowledged and placed in living system for its ongoing development, which is part of the actual ritual as you walk through the temple. In practical sense, the image also shows the importance of the symbolism and associations of the moon above, of recording and working with dreams and other visualization methods as a neophyte and subtle. It takes on a new meaning once the grade of Theoricus is attained that moon then becomes a symbol of self-reflection and the increasing import of the relationship between awareness and content, the conscious and the unconscious. The portal here is intimated by the three stones above it as the golden gate of Jerusalem, the gate which the Shekinah was said to pass, but now is sealed until the return of the Messiah. For the candidates to the mysteries, this has particular and peculiar significance. Of course, as the order of the hermits, we now know that the symbolism of the Shekinah and um, the Messiah correspond to Malkuth and Tifereth. And those are the Malkuth and Tifereth within the candidates. 
And on it goes for a couple of good pages um, on the symbolism of this one card. And this allows us to really map ourselves to the core framework underneath the Golden Dawn. And most importantly, most importantly, the core framework underneath the Waite Smith Tarot and the Thoth Tarot, because both Waite and Crowley were immersed in the Golden Dawn, as um, David Bowie sings, um, dressed in the robes of the Golden Dawn or something like that. Um, and so their decks had this sort of symbolic structure underneath them, whether they knew it or not. And I'll show you some um, remarkable examples of getting these cards and laying a Crowley Thoth card on top of them, the corresponding card, so like the world card for this one, or the Wheat Smith um, uh, card um, on top of these. Because again, Janine had no idea when she was designing them, and we still have no idea of how these match to whatever Megan showed weight. No deck exists. We only have the typewritten descriptions of what he saw, and it's likely he produced them, but whether they look like this or not, we will never have any idea. But nonetheless, we are absolutely sure that the symbolism holds because it works, and it works up the entire tree of life, and it even works when you overlay any of Crowley's cards or Waite's cards on top of them. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll put some up. Um, I have put some up before, um, but now, for uh, again, for our Order of Hermits, and this is the whole thing about secret orders, you'll now know a lot more meaning and context for those pictures when I put them up in the Facebook group. We'll all be able to go, hmm, we know what those are. We know what that means. We know the context of it. We know how this shows the underpinning of Kabbalah and the Shekinah and um, um, the Messiah within the industry process. And that I will be very pleased with if we got to roughly 50 of these sessions and we got to that level. Thank you all very much for having the attention span and the interest and the enthusiasm to get us to this point where we can talk about these things in a slightly more um, considered and serious way because we do have time to do it. Now, as we go back up the tree of life and tomorrow and in our final two or three sessions of our journey up the tree of life in these 10 sessions between 41 to 50, um, we're going to get very abstract and go all the way to the top of the tree before we um, journey back through the tunnel and um, get ourselves back home to Malkuth. And so I'd like to read um, today, just to finish, um, something rather interesting, rather strange um, by Terence Spinner. And I'll link you to the music that goes with this. It was originally put to music by the Shaman, um, the group, the Shaman, not the um, not just general Shaman in um, South America or anywhere else. But this was put to music, and um, Terence McKenna read this out. And I won't try and do his um, um, drawing accent. I'll just have to do it in my accent. Um, as well. And it eventually, um, just to make clear, it does boil down to um, talking about how drugs and music are really cool. Drugs and music are really cool. Um, <clears throat> but I like to listen to the other bits of it, whether you agree whether drugs and music are cool or not. And it's called a re evolution. And this is our gems. In the lockdown bedtime story for this evening, Re Evolution by Terence McKenna. If the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. Human history represents such a radical break with the natural systems of biological organization that preceded it that it must be the response to a kind of attractor or dwell point that lies ahead in the temporal dimension. 
persistently Western religions have integrated into their theologies the notion of a kind of end of the world. And I think that a lot of psychedelic experimentation sort of confirms this intuition. I mean, it isn't going to happen according to any of the scenarios of orthodox religion, but the basic intuition that the universe seeks closure in a kind of omega point of transcendence is confirmed. It's almost as though this object in hyperspace, glittering in hyperspace, throws off reflections of itself, which actually ricochet into the past, illuminating this mystic in spite of that saint or visionary, and that out of these fragmentary glimpses of eternity, we can build a kind of map of not only the past universe and the evolutionary ingression into novelty, but a kind of map of the future. This is what shamanism has always been about. A shaman is someone who has been to the end, is someone who knows how the world really works. And knowing how the world really works means to have risen outside, above, beyond the dimensions of ordinary space, time and causality, and actually seen the wire under the board, stepped outside the confines of learned culture and learned the embedded language into the domain of Wittgenstein be called the unspeakable. The transcendental presence of the other, which can be sectioned in various ways to yield systems of knowledge, which could be brought back into the ordinary social space for the good of the community. So in the context of 90% of human culture, the shaman has been the agent of evolution because the shaman learns techniques to go between ordinary reality and the domain of the ideas this high dimensional continuum that is somehow parallel to us, available to us, and yet ordinarily occluded to us by cultural convention. Out of the fear of the mystery, I believe, and what the shamans are, are people who have been able to decondition themselves from the community's instinctual distrust of the mysteries and go into this bewildering higher dimension and gain knowledge recover the jewel lost at the beginning of time, save souls, cure, commune the ancestors and so forth and so on. Shamanism is not a religion. It is a set of techniques and the principal technique is the use of psychedelic plants. What psychedelics do is they dissolve boundaries and in the presence of dissolved boundaries, one cannot continue to close one's eyes to the ruination of the earth the poisoning of the seas and the consequences of 2,000 years of unchallenged dominator culture based on monotheism, hatred of nature, suppression of the female, and so forth and so on. So what shamans have to do is act as exemplars by making this cosmic journey to the domain of the Gaian ideas and then bringing them back in the form of art to the struggle to save the world. The planet has a kind of intelligence that it can actually open a channel of communication with an individual human being. The message that nature sends is transform your language through a synergy between the electronic culture and the psychedelic imagination, a synergy between dance and idea, a synergy between understanding and intuition, and dissolve the boundaries which your culture has sanctioned between you become part of this Gaian supermind. I think, I mean, it's fairly profound. It's fairly apolitical. History is ending. I mean, we are the generation that witnesses the revelation of the purpose of the cosmos. History is the shock wave of the eschaton. History is the shock wave of eschatology. And what this means for those of us who will live through this transition into hypersis is that we will be privileged to see the greatest release of compressed change, probably since the birth of the universe. The 20th century is the shudder that announces the approaching cataracts of time over which our species and the destiny of this planet is about to be swept. If the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. The emphasis in house music and rave culture on psychologically compatible rhythms and this sort of thing is really the rediscovery of the art of natural magic with sound. That sound properly understood, especially 
ultra percussive sound can actually change neurological states. And large groups of people getting together in the presence of this kind of music are creating a telepathic community, a bonding. That hopefully will be strong enough to carry the vision out into the mainstream of society. I think the youth culture that is emerging in the 90s is an end of the millennial culture that is actually summing up Western civilization and pointing us in an entirely different direction that we are going to arrive in the third millennium in the middle of an archaic revival, which will mean a revival of these physiological empowering rhythm signals, a new art, a new social vision, a new relationship to nature, to feminism, to ego. All of these things are taking hold and not a moment too soon. Yeah. Um, eschatology is the science of or religious belief of an end of the world um, belief system in some way or another. Um, Derek, that's not from a book. That was a piece of writing. It may be in one of McKenna's books. Um, I don't have McKenna's books with me at the moment. Um, they're in the library. Um, but um, um, it's a piece called Re-Evolution. I'll um, give you a link to it in the for this uh, video and it was set to music um, by the um, by shaman um, okay so um, I just wanted to read that as part of the visionary and the fact that it applies to right now in the same way that Dion Fortune was writing about life now Terence McKenna was writing about life now. Um, I will try and find, again, I'm, I'm not at my, um, I don't have a lot of my books with me at the moment, but um, and there's a piece in um, uh, the Confessions of Alistair Crowley that is absolutely remarkable. Crowley wrote about the future of industry, of newspapers, of commercialism, of Western culture, in a couple of pages, right buried at the back of um, uh, Confessions of Alistair Crowley. And it's a remarkable, remarkable um, piece of writing uh, that applies so much now. And he actually uh, foretold that we return to what he called or the handmade unique culture, the fact that um, people would go back to more unique handmade and what are now called artisan uh, products. And he, he reasoned that out. And the reasons that he gives, the thinking he gives, are very applicable. Very applicable. You can see why that's happened now. And Crowley, were, again, these people were way ahead of their time because they were listening to that future point, that hayseed point, and seeing where the river wasn't going, they were seeing where it was coming from, because it is ahead of us. The future is ahead of us, and when we see the future, we can work out how to go towards it, and that is the trick. We are not returning to Eden, we are the products of the future Eden, and that is the trick and part of the flip around Hayshead and those are dead rates at the top that everything turns upside down. And you might guess where the hanged man then is. The hanged man is on the other side here underneath Bora because everything switches above this point. Inner and outer, upper and lower, self, universe, reality, illusion, they all fit inside out at that point of the initiation system. So I'd like to leave you with those um, um, deep and profound thoughts. Um, actually, my two cards for today, if you have a look on my Facebook page, were um, existence and depth. Um, the two cards were existence and depth. So perhaps, um, that's where, where we're heading. So we're going to go above the abyss tomorrow. We're going to look at that Trinity, we're going to look at Kita, Zen, No Self, I Ching a little bit, and a few other bits and pieces before we can um, head back down, um, um, head back down the um, tree of life.
Okay then, thanks a lot everyone. Um, good evening, uh, look after yourself, look after each other. We are heading through that tunnel, we're almost on the other side. We, um, as um, Boris Johnson said today, and the UK Prime Minister, it's like an Alpine tunnel that we can just see the light out at the other end, but we have to be careful that there isn't another mountain waiting for us on the other side of it. So um, take care everyone and um, see you all uh, tomorrow. Bye for now.